Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first webinar hosted by Energis Corporation. I'm Gordon Bell, Vice President of Marketing at Energis, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Today's webinar is titled Designing with What Up? This is the first in a series of planned webinars where topics may range from general introduction of our What Up wireless charging technology to specific applications of the technology itself. Our goal for today's webinar is to provide additional technical and product details to those interested companies and potential future partners. During the webinar, you may submit questions via Zoom, which we'll try to answer during the Q&A at the end of today's presentation. We will also be posting contact information at the end of today's webinar, where you reach out to us with any additional questions. I'd like to now introduce our speaker for today, Neeraj Sajpal, Senior Vice President of Marketing and Strategy at Energist Corporation. Hey, Neeraj, turning it over to you and, and on mic, uh, unmute, and you'll be on set. Hi, Egon, can you hear me now? Hello, Garn, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Neeraj, you're all set. Hi. Thanks, Garn. Uh, good morning, everybody in the Americas, and good evening in Europe. Um, as Gordon suggested, um, we would like to share with you what progress we have made um, in recent times in, in taking the technology uh, way forward. So today's agenda is we are going to briefly talk about the company for, for partners or people on the call who, who do not know much about us. We're going to talk about our take on wireless power. And then we'll go to our technology roadmap and the other product details, which will help all of you to think about how this technology can be integrated into the, into the products. We'll also talk about our go-to-market strategy, what we call incremental roadmap, more details on the water implementation on receiver and transmitter design, and then we'll open for Q&A. Please send your questions via Zoom to Gordon and me. So Nergis um, is an is a early stage uh, company which is based in San Jose, California. We have about 50 employees. Um, we are focused on RF power, and I would like to clarify RF power means antenna to antenna technology, not the coil to coil. Uh, we have an exclusive partnership with Dialog Semiconductors for sales and manufacturing. In a big picture, we are a business unit of Dialog, which is outside uh, the dialogue uh, so that we can take advantage of their significant sales and uh, manufacturing reach. Um, we are very, very focused on enabling the uh, fabulous semi uh, business model. What it means is that our goal is to sell chips to our customers. I agree in the early stage of uh, any technology, we have to work at the system level, but the goal remains that we will be able to, uh, we'll be able to sell the chips to you. Today we have the roadmap in the CMOS, GAN and GAS. I'll be talking more about what kind of chip technologies that we have. Uh, we are working on multiple segments with multiple partners and I will be sharing with you more details on that. The, our claim to fame is at distance charging. We were the first company to be awarded the part 18 uh, power at a distance in December, 2017. We have been recently awarded uh, additional uh, FCC approval for distance and I'll be briefly talking about them too. Uh, as of today, we are approved to ship in 112 countries, including Europe, Japan, and North America, and we'll continue to work in extending this to uh, China and uh, Korea. Uh, when we started the company, it was going to be a lot more technology that will be developed. And to protect that, we have gone ahead in terms of uh, getting a lot of patents portfolio done. As of today, we have around 222 patents issued, and I'll be briefly talking about the areas where those patents are so that you can rest assured the technology is well protected. So there, first of all, thank you for sending all the questions and joining today. Um, I will be said, I'll be addressing most of those questions which you have sent earlier. During the presentation, if something is not addressed, please feel free to send those questions also. Uh, 
our goal has not changed. Most of the time I see this question, are you really focused on near field or have you abandoned the at distance charging? That's not true. As you'll see in the presentation uh, today, we believe in an incremental roadmap. What it means is that we have understood what would it take to take wireless power forward. And our approach is going to be incremental starting from near field and all the way to dis higher distance and higher power. Our vision has not changed. Our vision remains same that the distance is important and will continue to add the distance to our portfolio. So let's just talk about um, how you really take a new technology forward. When you think about a new technology, um, I've been th through this process about four times in my uh, professional life. And I always think about it, okay, how do you really see that a new technology has to move forward? There are three risks for every new uh, technology. Number one is the market risk. Second is the execution risk. And the third is external risk. And when you start to combine all those three risks, then you start to look into the opportunity that comes in front of the, of, of a new technology. When we start, we always look into more promising uh, avenues in terms of what market can deliver. But as soon as you progress, you start to realize the technology limitation, what technology can do at the various point of time. And then you start to look into what are the external factors. So wireless power is not a new technology. Wireless power is about 100 years old. It has been demonstrated that you can send the power. And I also got a question that, you know, it is there because the communication uh, or the, the devices today use the wireless power. That is true. But the communication devices use a different part of the wireless power transmission. They are very, very focused on sending the data, but they're not focused on the efficiency of transfer. On the other side, wireless power is focused on efficiency of power transfer. They're not really focused on the data. So these are two very different way of looking into uh, sending power at a distance. So when we think about wireless power market today, we need to think about the technology capabilities because that's what it is important. If we cannot prove that technology is viable in terms of uh, taking to smaller size, higher efficiency, I don't think so it will be commercially viable. At the same time, when you think about customer application, the partnership is needed with customers and partners. You need to learn from that process, then figure out what part of the TAM is possible today and what we can enable as we progress on the technology side. The third factor, which is very important for RF technology, is the regulatory approvals. Regulators, by definition, are not there to allow you to send whatever you want to do. They, they turn towards your technology over time. You need to prove them that it is safe in a, in a transmitter as well as the receiver configuration. And as I'm showing in this slide, when you start to look into these three aspects, what customers will accept, what technology can deliver, and what regulators will accept in terms of uh, sending the power, you start to understand what is possible today. And then more and more technology is available tomorrow. More regulators are warming up to the technology and customers are also looking into the ways to use the technology. That's the vision we have. That's the wireless charging 2.0 paradigm we talk about. The, uh, the new paradigm for wireless charging is not about how fast you charge. It's about that you do not need to really think about charging. And that's what Energis is focused on. That's why we all join Energis and we really believe in that goal. So why water? Water will differentiate from existing technology like Qi, WPC, from WPC or the res resins or NFC that can allow you to charge at a short distance as well as a long distance. It can charge multiple devices. You'll, be, you'll have orientation freedom. You will not have the issues of object detection, which are also called foreign object detection. You can charge devices at 90 degree and different uh, angles and form factor. In addition to that, you can actually implement a low cost inbox charging solution as well as a higher efficiency, higher power solution. When you put together all of these features, you start to see where the wireless charging 2.0 can go. In terms of market, we have significant opportunity as, as I'm gonna show that today. In terms of execution, I'm very proud to present a team which has done wonders in terms of uh, driving the technology forward. And our regulatory team, is larger than all the other competition combined. With all these three factors, we are, we are probably the best company placed 
in terms of addressing the wireless power opportunity. So let's just talk about, uh, I did a uh, blog for two weeks back talking about uh, what does the incremental roadmap be, means and how can we really leverage to think about wireless power. Uh, you, when you think about wireless power, you need to think in two dimensions. One is the distance between the transmitter and receiver. The other is the receive power to various devices. And you start to see that you need to segment that graph. You cannot address the whole opportunity with one technology, with one solution, and one way of doing things. You have to start to think about where is the opportunity in terms of addressing the market. So we have defined uh, various section of this graph. Near field, as we call it, uh, 0.5 centimeter, and the power can be all, all the way from 10 milliwatt or one milliwatt of a sensor network in a, uh, to all the way to 40 watt of a, of a phone application. At the same time, we will continue to progress on the distance that goes to midfield, midfield plus, far field, and all the way to harvesting. Uh, we have decided to remain uh, focused on first opportunity in the market, which we called near field low power opportunity, which is all the way to 250 milliwatt and 0.5 centimeter. If you look into the TAM for that opportunity, that's significant. Almost all the hearing aid market, hearable, wearable, classes, multiple of those products fall into that power level. And sometimes I hear this from many of our customers, why should I really care about this technology? Gee, is there, that can give me a near field distance. That's not true. If you think about what Qi can do, um, Qi cannot go really lower than one watt. They have a lot of the struggle in achieving those kind of powers in a short, in a smaller ge geometry. In addition to that, if you do not have a flat surface, Qi will have a problem there. What is the ideal device for us? Ideal device for us is a small size, does not have a flat surface, and it requires charging every day. And if, if you try to map those features to the TAM, that consists of almost all hearable, all wearable medical sensors and smart glasses. We have an opportunity to untap the market right now, and that's what we are doing. In addition to that, we'll continue to progress the, uh, the, our technology to address midfield, uh, higher power on the near field, and the harvesting. In addition to that, almost all the, all the segments here, we have the technology today. It's all about taking the technology to commercialization. And that's what this chart represents. We have decided to focus on commercializing sub-segments of this chart so that we continue to track what the wireless power can do while negotiating the regulatory constraints as well as the execution constraints. In the near field, we are focused on five markets, hearable, we are focused on uh, five market hearable, which can also be divided into hearing aid market as well as the general hearable market. We are focused on smart glasses, wearable, home IoT solution, and medical sensors. Altogether, the six of these markets represent a significant opportunity in front of us. In addition to that, we are working with select partners in the long-term opportunity gaming, industrial IoT, military, public safety, portable computer, and mobile phone. So if you could see from a market opportunity standpoint, in spite of all the SAM, we have to address over time, we have a significant opportunity in front of us. What that means is market risk for our company is low. So let's just talk about why should you care about water? As I mentioned, if you think about the charging adoption today, especially from the Qi, not many of you actually have the Qi transmitter at home, very few of them. Uh, today, phone vendors are thinking about not to include wireless charging uh, defined by Qi in, in, in geography like India and China, because they don't see really an additional value what they're seeing, but why? Because consumer benefit is limited. If I still have to keep my charge in a tightly coupled uh, situation, that's not really a good consumer experience. So the consumer experience means the freedom of how you would like to put the device and how, would, how you would like to charge. What that means is you may not be able to charge fast, but as I said earlier, it is important to understand that charging is not about just charging fast. 
it's more important that think you don't have to think about charging. The, the thinking about charging is what the consumer expectation is, and they would like to address this with as um, at, at a lower cost as much as possible. So we can provide our solution in a very small size. You can see the smallest receiver implementation we have. Uh, the WLCSP chip, which we have, is 1.7 to 1.4 millimeter. And you can think, we can place these receiver implementation is the smallest hearing aid device, which is in the canal. All the way to a phone implementation, we can, we can provide higher power. This allows us a flexibility that the architecture is scalable. We can provide the user-friendly experience and the design is pretty rugged because you don't have to worry about connectors or, or the USB or the pogo pin connectors. So let's just talk about the technology. Um, so in order to address the um, wireless power, you really require a system approach because it's a new technology. You don't find even the antenna designers who can design for power. Most of them have only known designing for communication devices. It's a very new set of skill which we have acquired over the last six years as a team. So what are the key components that enable the technology? The most important is silicon. Why? Because the limitation for the wireless power comes from the efficiency. If we cannot provide an end-to-end -end high efficiency, then you cannot really have a solution that can fit into smaller size because the lower efficiency meet, you have to navigate the thermal constraints. And that means the size will be bigger and the cost will be bigger too. So from the start, we were very, very focused on making sure that we develop transmitter designs and receiver design at a very high efficiency. And today we have a very large portfolio of a design that can go from uh, receivers all the way from small milliwatts to 40 watt. Um, and the transmitter technology that is highly integrated. We have our beamforming technology that can allow us to have beamforming solution. And the power amplifier can go from one watt to 100 watt. If you start to see from this perspective, you start to see that we have created the pieces that is required to create this wireless power solution. In addition to that, the significant system work has been done, including the software, including the BLE software that is, that is used to control the device and the, the antenna design. Our antenna technology at 900 megahertz using the fractal solution provide the smallest possible solution 900 megahertz. And a lot of time this question comes, why 900 megahertz? Why not 60 gig or 24 gig? Let me just share with you. We're a semiconductor company. We have done the development in 60, we have done the development in 5.8, and done the development in 2.4, done in 900, done in 40 megahertz. We are the only company in the wireless power ecosystem who has understood what it takes to develop solution at different frequencies. And they're very important. If you think about, a lot of companies uh, will talk to you that, oh, they can deliver this much power at that much distance. Um, they want to go to higher frequency because they can develop smaller antennas. To us, that's a myopic way of looking at it. Because if you only think about antenna size, I agree, it goes smaller when the frequency goes higher, but you do not look into the system aspect. And that's, that's what I call myopic view of looking at it. You need to look into the complete solution all the way from AC that goes into the transmitter to the DC that goes into the battery and the receiver. When you start to look into that aspect, you start to realize it's just not the antenna size. You need to look into the efficiency, how the silicon efficiency changes with respect to different frequencies. And actually you'll notice higher the uh, frequency, lower the efficiency. Then you need to start to look into what amount of power you need to transmit from the transmitter receiver to negotiate the path loss at various frequencies. It has to be a system approach. And we have mastered that approach thanks to all the partner with whom we have worked over the years. So let's just talk more details about how our structure, how our system solution looks like. I put together five cases, which goes all the way on that graph from near field to, to a midfield solution we just announced the approval for, the beam forming solution and the far field solution and harvesting solution. And you start to see a common thread. Our approach was going to be that we, the receiver design should remain consistent. Why is that? 
because we, we think the transmitter technology will progress over, over time and then receivers should be able to charge from different transmitters at different rate because the path loss will increase over time, over distance. So the typical uh, near field design, I've given a solution which is for the hearing aid market, which is our first market. We are working with multiple customers in this segment today. And before I go into this design, let me just share with you why they want to work with water. They have two very big problems. If you look into the size of a hearing aid, this can be as small as IIC, which is invisible in the canal, all the way to BT, which is more traditional. They would not like to have a separate transmitter for this receiver and this receiver. They would like to have one transmitter that can cover all the way. They will charge at a different rate because the antenna on the receive side is smaller, but they should be able to give a uniform experience that I can charge in one to two hours because the battery size changes. And that is only possible with the RF solution that we provide. You cannot have a coil solution because the coil required for a smaller device and a bigger device is different. But for an antenna implementation that we have done, we can actually have a small same transmitter that can go from here to here seamlessly. In addition to that, if I can fix the location of the receivers, I can charge at a much higher efficiency than even cheap solutions. In addition to that, you cannot have a cheap solution in a small size. So when you start to look into these benefits of RF, you start to see that we are uniquely placed to address these markets. So let's talk about this block diagram. On the transmitter side, all these designs can be powered by USB, so they are lower power design. Uh, we use BLE to communicate between transmitter receiver, we call the control plane. The receivers can tell when to charge, when not to charge, how much charge to increase or decrease. In addition to that, we also use BLE for some level of authentication. DA4100 is a device that has been designed by Energis and uh, uh, manufactured by Dialog. That is a highly integrated transmitter to control all aspects of transmitter. And the DA3210 is a 900 megahertz lower power uh, cost effective PA. And it goes to the antenna and there is a path loss here. You get the, the receive here and then it goes to a very simple circuit with, which basically means one receiver chip two capacitors that goes into a DC to DC, goes to the PMIC and it provides the battery. If you start to think about it, it's a very simple design, but a lot of technology has been implemented here. This DA4100 is significant integration. It allows you not only control, but the authentication that only Energis to Energis technology can work together. This power amplifier, we're not using the standard five gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz communication power amplifier which are not designed for power. These, design, these power amplifiers have been designed for power. They're higher efficiency solution for a constant waveform. Antenna technology, we have done significant amount of antenna technology. We believe in providing a toolkit to our customers and we, we help them to achieve what they're looking for. On the receive side, one or many antennas can be implemented for diversity and because each of receiver path has four, chip, four receiver paths. So let's look into the other, the midfield solution. This is what we announced the uh, few, few, few days back, the approval for. If you look into this design, receiver remains the same. It can be implemented. What we start to see is the midfield solution is very good for higher size of the ID. For example, these, uh, the headsets, these glasses, and even bigger watches also. What we have changed here is, we are able to get higher power using our GAN power amplifier implementation because they can go all the way from four watt to 100 watts. This allows us to have a uh, technology which will be available in short while and will allow us to transfer the power at a shorter distance, 15 centimeter to 30 centimeter, and that will allow to have these devices placed in a lot more freedom. Then this is our beam forming solution. I got some uh, questions regarding this. I would like to clarify here. The approval which we have just announced does not replace the beam forming solution. We offer both. What it means is that if you look into the, how we are approaching the market, this is a midfield plus solution. What it means is for shorter distance, we have implemented the single PA, single antenna, which is very cost effective, 
can be put into smaller size solution. That's what the approval, the recent approval is for. Our early approval is for beam forming solution, which we definitely feel has a value at a desktop level, which will be one meter to three meter market. And we continue to explore that option. Beam forming allows us to provide higher distance, more power, but it cannot fit into smaller size and the cost uh, trade-off has to be done for various kind of devices. That's where the new approval comes in, into play. If you look into the receiver, receiver remains the same. 1210 is our beam forming solution and this is the GAN PA. Now you start to see that multiple of these PA structures can be done, driving multiple PAs, creating a beam forming structure, going into the same structure receivers. So let's just talk about the harvesting, which is what we call zone eight, the, the, the smaller power, longer distance. Harvesting in our opinion is a market that's a developing right now. There is no clarity in terms of how the harvesting will be done because market is too big in terms of feature side. We believe the harvesting will be done in two ways. Number one is, which is called ambient harvesting, that there is a power available either from a GSM microcell in 900 megahertz or 2.4 or 5.8 gig. We are watching these implementation, but what we feel is that the ambient power is going to be very small. Let me just give you a picture. The amount of power you receive at your, at your Wi-Fi device is an actually milliwatts. Once you convert that after the RF to DC, it'll be microwatts or nanowatts power. That is not really significant power you will go into a situation where the most of the harvesting opportunity will transition to something called a dedicated transmitter. And we feel that that's where the market is going. The smart home, retail, enterprise, industrial, these are different kinds of markets. In some markets, regulatory constraints can be even relaxed. For example, the industrial market, where you may not find humans in the areas where machines are operating and you might be able to increase the transmitter power. I think this uh, harvesting market is developing and we, we have solutions in this market which we are working with our lead partners as I speak today. These are the, some of the examples of the design which we have done for our customers. And there's one common thread. These are all production ready designs. These are not something a conceptual design. We are working very, very closely with our partners and customers trying to take this market forward. It's not easy, but it's worthwhile to do it. And the team which we have is developing significant amount of uh, innovation, trying to take this technology for, forward. For example, this design, this is a complete BT design, such a small antenna implementation that has been done. This is a, this is a single uh, receiver that has the receiver design as well as the BLE design as well as the processing. You can look into the various implementation on hearable, the, the, uh, all the other tag opportunity which we're doing. So these are smaller in size, smaller in implementation, and easy to implement. As I, see, as I said earlier, the cost of implementing a receiver is well, well below 50 cents. So if you're the product manager of these devices, you'll not think twice before adding that as, as a default receiver. You may start with a, with a um, like the off the shelf transmitter first, start to see how the attach happens, and then you can actually go towards a integrated transmitter, which can be shipped with the box. But we do see a lot more opportunities starting as one-to-one, -one, going towards um, a ecosystem from a bigger tier ones, moving towards a standard-based approach. So how can you really take advantage of what we have done so far? So early last year, we started uh, transitioning from a custom one-to-one -one design with our partners to a reference-based design. So these are the four reference designs available today to all of you. You can take one of these designs which is closer to your segment and you can understand how this technology can be implemented. And then you can take this design uh, in terms of uh, all the aspects of uh, hardware, software, and start integrating with your product. We are starting to see good progress in terms of uh, adoption with these reference design. The IoT tracker is a standard design. This can be implemented into all kind of industrial IoT applications, which 
our customer like POSCOs are doing. Then we are hearable design that allows you to have uh, two AirPod kind of devices can be charged from, from a two transmitter design. Then you have a hearing aid design, which is a very miniature design implemented for BTE. Then the smart glasses. And smart glasses is a very interesting market. It's developing right now. Smart glasses are not only used for AR, VR, they're actually being used for the, the bone conduction sound uh, use case, in addition to all kind of medical use cases. So you can order these uh, reference kits based upon how close these designs are to your, to your, to your application. These are the two first products that has come to the market. Um, most of you know about it. I'd like to talk a little bit about them. Um, the first product that from Delight was the first implementation of uh, water. And I think for the first implementation of any RF technology from a customer. It was not a kit. It was a design offered by, uh, by a customer partner. The new sound design is our first BLE enabled design. It's a complete design where there is a lot more freedom on the transmitter surface and it is, uh, it's controlled and managed by the BLE link. This design was announced uh, earlier last week and sorry, earlier last year and now it's going toward production. So far I talked about the technology. So let's just talk about the external, which is the regulatory. As you have been following us, you know that we have been making significant progress in terms of getting more and more approval, first at FCC, then at the global level. As of now, we are approved to ship in 112 countries, including US and Europe. And uh, we are very proud of our, our recent approval in Japan. We are the first company for the part 18 approval. And we just recently announced our approval for the midfield that can go all the way to 40 centimeter with higher power. Our strategy is very simple. Let's look into the opportunity which is available in the current regulatory definitions and see what we can do while keeping the definition open. For example, part 15 allows you to four, four watt transmit power. We have gone to four watt level power using part 18. Then we have pushed the limits on the transmitter power by showing that our SAR limits, our emission limits are within accepted norms. And we continue to push from that angle. In addition to that, we are also coming from the standardization perspective. Our team is working in ITU, Etsy, so that tomorrow a path can be paved for a global standard for wireless power based on 900 megahertz. We continue to make progress. It's not easy, but I, but I think our regulatory team has done a tremendous job in getting us closer and closer to what is possible at a global level. So let's just talk about uh, where do we feel the key value of our uh, portfolio is. Um, th there was a question that came that, are you abandoning beam form? No, we are not abandoning beam forming as I addressed earlier. Beam forming for us will address a market which will be uh, longer than 15 centimeter will be higher power and will go all the way till to, to five meters. We really believe in what we have developed so far. So the key pieces of the technologies are the chip, which is the transmitter and receiver, the all kind of antenna design, how we process the power um, and how different kind of Bluetooth control we have implemented in addition to how the hardware has been implemented. If you look into the four or five areas, these are critical areas where Energis has developed significant portfolio to, to address the RF power. There, there have been some questions on how, does, how long does it take to adopt this technology? In short, it really depends. If you're, if, you're, if you're designing a hearing aid today, you can actually take to the market in a very short while. If you're designing a complete different kind of solution, it might take longer. I wanted to give you a perspective how our customer engagements are going in a typical engagement. The first phase is evaluation, where a customer can buy a reference kit, look at it from a perspective, how they can implement in their design. We provide all the portfolio in terms of hardware design, um, software design, antenna design, or they can ask us to develop a proof of concept. What it means is that we take the receiver device, implement our technology 
into a receiver designs, which is what they care about the most. And then show that receiver working in addition to all the standard functionality of that device, for example, hearable device, if it cannot be used for Bluetooth communication while charging, that's a problem. We demonstrate all that with a standard transmitter, which we have as a reference kit. And customer evaluates that. And at that point of time, they decide to move forward. We call customer design in. Then it goes through development phase, which is called engineering build, design build, and production build. And in between, we are also monitoring how that design can be taken to regulatory approvals. Once the PVT build is over, customer moves to design win, where they, have they are more focused on how it can go to production. We have many more designs in the pre-production stage right now. We're going through all the, all the things that is required to build the first 10 to first thousand and, and, and hopefully millions in near future. It goes to mass production. It is introduced into the market. Uh, it has been, I think first few products are always difficult to put in the market because we are learning and uh, we are very proud of what we are learning. But I assure you from here, the learning curve is going to be shorter and shorter. We're going to take those learning and make sure we can move faster. But it takes some time to take any technology to production and that's what we are focused on. Moving forward, um, this is what we are looking at. We believe, we are very thankful to what Qi has done, established a wireless charging market. And then we call that wireless charging 1.0 because it has not really met the consumer expectation. We are moving toward what we call charging 2.0 where there's a freedom. But at the same time, you need to understand there will be limitation as the distance progresses. Power at a distance will be lower efficiency will be lower. But that's what the paradigm shift has to happen. It's not about how fast you charge, is that you never have to think about charging. I mentioned in my blog also, they, this, was, this is what the transition has happened in other areas. For example, we do not worry about processing because Moore's Law took care of it. We don't worry about connectivity because the Wi-Fi today is very good. I used to carry an Ethernet cable five years back. I was not sure whether Wi-Fi will be there or not. I don't carry that Ethernet cable today I, because I'm very, very sure that I'll be able to connect. Once I connect, the storage is not a problem. The only, only one frontier left that needs to be overcome is the power. But that will require a paradigm shift. It's not about how fast you charge. It's all about do you have to worry about charge. With that, I hand it off to Gordon. Thank you, Neeraj. Um, we're gonna go ahead and start to, to take some Q&A from the group. We have quite a few uh, folks uh, attending this webinar. So we have had quite a lot of uh, questions put into uh, the queue. And we're gonna try to answer those as, as, as uh, much as we can before uh, our time is up. Um, and then also, of course, we appreciate your attendance and participation in today's webinar. We do hope that you join us on our next webinar that's scheduled for May 27th. We'll have some additional details on that uh, coming soon. And then also after the webinar, you can always reach us at uh, sales at You can also go to our website and find our contact information there, both for PR, IR, as well as general sales and other inquiries. Uh, with that, Neeraj, I'll go ahead and let you start to take some of the questions. Um, so Gorn, let me make a, because I have, um, thanks for all the question which, which um, we have received. Um, I would like to answer two questions first, because that's what a um, lot of um, uh, participants wanted to know. Is that okay, Gorn? Sure, that's great. Okay, so one, uh, most of you wanted to understand how does the, uh, the recent approval MF550 is different than what we got in December 2017. I alluded to that early in the presentation. So let me clearly state that these are two different approvals. They address different markets and they are not replacing uh, each other. Beamforming solution, if you look into the beamforming application, there is an antenna aperture required. Number of antennas or number of PA to create a beamform can be six, eight, or nine. When you put those antennas and transmitter 
in a, a, a transmitter uh, antennas in a transmitter design, you start to see there's a limitation on the size. What we have approved and two weeks back is path breaking. You could use a single antenna, single power amplifier to create a charging zone up to 40 centimeter. And that allows you to have the lowest cost structure available and smallest size. Now you start to think this can fit into clock radio kind of design. It can fit into Wi-Fi access point design. It can fit into smaller uh, smart speaker design. At the same time, the beamforming solution will go into a desktop level, where it can be integrated to monitor, it can be integrated to, uh, to gaming console. So these are two different applications and they will coexist because they are addressing different markets. The other question, uh, what are we doing for harvesting? And uh, uh, so we have been working in harvesting, especially in the retail areas and industrial IoT application with our lead customers. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we believe the uh, it will be a may not be ambient uh, harvesting. Primarily in in the industrial and the retail market, there will be a small transmitter that can be uh, implemented um, and that can be charging various, um, for example, electronic shelf labeling or different sensors or for the robotic arm application. Uh, the transmitter technology which I'm talking about for MF five fifty. That can be extended to all these distances, and you start to see a lowest cost, uh, low, lowest cost architecture available with the nurgers that can address all these market and harvesting. There was another question around the six gigahertz Wi-Fi. We we are a chip company. We'll continue to look for the opportunity. We are not married to one frequency or other. Although we find 900 megahertz is the best option possible to take the wireless power forward but we can take advantage of our, all these skills that we have on the receiver side and uh, implement the harvesting solution for six gigahertz moving forward. Gordon, let's take some few more questions. Sure, uh, first question we have from Dinesh Kathani from Omdia, formerly IHS, and he's asking if we can throw some light on the recent regulatory approval that we received in the tough Japanese market and how tough it was and how we anticipate it might help speed up work in other countries. Okay, so um, I think the, um, the, uh, the, the ISM band, uh, which is what is, is easier to get approval, nanner megahertz is an ISM band in the, in the uh, North America as well as in certain part of Europe. So it was easier to get approval because they are defined in that way. In the case of Japanese market, we continue to work with uh, many customers in that market and regulators also. We want to make sure that we can provide a near field approval that can allow us to have these devices in the, in the hearing aid, hearable market cell in Japan. Our, uh, our regular team has done tremendous effort in convincing the regulators in Japan that not only our technology is safe, but it it's also follows all the regulation, regulatory approval required for the emission as well as the absorption. And it, it's going to help tremendously. The regulatory world is all about the momentum. When the regulators see the approvals coming from the other part of the world, they're more inclined to provide approval in, in their geography. That's why we work with a uh, lot many uh, uh, customers in, in specific ge geography so that we can continue to provide that kind of information for regulators in other geographies. Karn? Great. Um, then we have some additional questions here. One question is, can you stack multiple harvesting chips or receiver chips in devices to increase the total power input to the device? For example, place 50 receivers in a phone or other type of device. That's a very good question. It goes back to the basics of RF, right? Um, if you pack the antennas too close, they start to correlate with each other and you do not really get a gain. I came from the Wi-Fi world, so I, let me give you an example. Uh, and the receiver design, the receiver diversity is very important, but at the same time, you can actually if provide two antennas in the receiver. If they're not correlated to each other, you might be able to add them. But it, it's a complicated uh, subject because they need to be not in the same phase or maybe in the same phase. 
You need to have those kind of designs. But if they're very close, no, then you cannot. But if they're separated in the RF space, then they may be. Okay, another question. Uh, how many of Energis's competitors or other companies in the wireless power transfer space have received as many global approvals as Energis? Uh, I think the, this is a good question, whom we see our competition, right? Uh, let me just throw some light on that. Um, if you look into the competition landscape for, for wireless power, um, I, I look at a three level, what are we competing against? At the first level, we are competing against the USB POGO, POGO pins and even the AC powers. At the second level, we are comparing, we should use a coupled technology or uncoupled technology. When I mean by coupled technology is the Qi. And then the uncoupled technology has resins, RF, laser, light. And then you look in the third level when you state, okay, what are the ways the different uncoupled technologies addressing the market? Uh, at this point in time, uh, based upon what I, I know, there are not many RF approvals. Definitely Qi is very well established and we are very thankful for that, that they have created the mindset of RF power. Uh, I do not, I have not seen many RF approvals uh, from, uh, from our competition. Okay, another one is, uh, what is the difference between an antenna for communication versus an antenna for power? Both require higher efficiency if battery power is to be consumed. It depends upon what you're focused on, right? The antenna for communication, the goal is to transmit the, the data. That means the, the, your ability to have the, the fidelity of the data over the airwaves is more important than the, the, the efficiency of how you transfer. Uh, in the case of power, the, the efficiency of power transfer in the air is important. Uh, so it really depends upon what you focus on. Communication device, if you look into the, uh, what amount of power you really get on your cell phone when you're talking or you're getting your website is, is in, uh, in nanowatt to milliwatts. But the communication which you're getting, the data which you're getting is very important. In the case of wireless power, that's not true. You're not really focused on uh, the, the data coming on the same frequency but you're more focused on the power. That's a difference between uh, the kind of modulation you do. Uh, modulation is not good for power efficiency. So it really depends on what the, uh, the end goal is and the communication versus power are two different kinds of antenna structure. Okay, next question is, if you, meaning Energist, make the chips, what does it mean to be part 18 certified? Doesn't it depend on the customer's antennas that these chips are working with? It's a, when we say part 18 approved, it's a system approved. So you're right about that. But the question is, how do you really get that system in play so that it can be approved at that level? You require efficiency of the semiconductor. That's where the chips comes in. You require the control, how you control the beam, how you control um, the antenna structure. But yes, antenna plays a part of the system. So it's not just chip or antenna, it's how the, antenna interacts with the chip and how chips control the antenna, that makes a solution uh, viable for a consumer application as well as for regulatory approvals. Another question is, why can't we have small coils for Qi, for instance, say five millimeters in diameter for inductive charging? Uh, it goes back to the, the, the basic difference between coil and non-coil technology, H field versus the E field. Um, in order to create the edge field, you cannot have very small coil. When you get to the small coils, you won't, you won't be able to get that amount of power and the heat will be more. In addition to that, because they are tightly coupled, try to imagine trying to focus a receiver device on a smaller coil and trying to align tightly to it, which is a challenge. So from a requirement perspective, you won't be able to get a smaller coil because that will not give you a high fidelity, which is required for power transfer. At the same time, the orientation freedom is going to be very difficult. Okay, another question is, 
Do we have any view on South Korea and China approvals in terms of estimated time? I would, we expect those approvals to come um, sometime this year. Uh, we are working very closely with our customers. The way the regulatory approval works is that not only you have to demonstrate to those regulators in those geographies that your technology is safe from emission as well as the absorption, which is the SAR, they also need to see the market demand. So we work with local companies to make sure the local uh, regulators see the need for this technology in that geography. Um, we, we continue to move forward. Uh, COVID-19 has, has, uh, has put some challenges. In spite of that, we are making good progress. Uh, we'll continue to uh, make progress on these approvals with our regulatory partners, as well as our, uh, our um, uh, product partners. Okay, and finally, last question is, what will future webinars have to offer and how often will they continue to happen? So as Gordon said, like uh, we, we intend to have these webinars in the last week of every month. I'm gonna pick the topic based upon um, um, different segments. For example, the next webinar can be more focused on, for example, the uh, midfield application. After that, we can talk more about the harvesting application. We can then pick up different segments like why our solution is perfect for hearing or the hearable or, or enterprise class headsets or desktop or gaming. So we're going to pick different topics in these webinars and focus on them. We're going to also invite our customers, um, industry experts, uh, who will also participate with us to showcase why this technology needs to go to market. Thank you, Neeraj. And once again, we do appreciate everyone's attendance and participation today. Um, it was a very successful in terms of attendance. We'd also have another webinar, if you, in, in case you only re, were able to listen to half of this, we have another webinar planned for this evening at 7 p.m. Pacific time. And please reach out to us if you have any additional questions at sales at Thank you so much. Thank you.